At Trelleborg, almost 900,000 cubic feet of earth, stone, and clay make up nearly a third of a mile of 56-foot thick earth ramparts. Just outside the walls lies a burial site with over a hundred skeletons, some in mass graves. Clues suggest that 16 Viking longhouses sit behind heavily defended walls. So what exactly is Trelleborg? And why was it built? Trelleborg doesn't appear in any written records. Archaeologists didn't even realize it was a Viking structure until the 1930s. It's really a fantastic and magnificent monument, Trelleborg. Anne Christine Larson is Trelleborg's director. Until experts started digging here, it was thought most Vikings only lived in small farms and villages. Trelleborg is, is a very unique site in many senses. It's nothing like the villages around. Trelleborg looks like a simple structure with ramparts made of earth and piled stones. But archaeologists like Anne Christine can tell from detailed surveys that Trelleborg is a masterpiece of advanced engineering. A geometrically perfect circle, some 450 feet across, aligned to the compass. It's quite clever, actually. Trelleborg has four gates, and they are pointed to the compass, meaning that one is pointed to north, one to the south, one east, one west. Anne Christine thinks Trelleborg showcases an astonishing new level of sophistication in Viking architecture. A thousand years ago, when the Vikings built this fortress, they put out the ramparts very accurate, completely circular. And it's amazing that today we actually need this to do what the Vikings did without any equipment. A ring is the perfect shape for a fortress with a clear line of sight from every point on the wall. But Anne Christine suspects that Trelleborg's precise geometry goes far beyond what's needed for defense. This was designed to display prestige and power. So what exactly went on here? A clue might be hidden on the other side of these ramparts. Outside the Viking structure, archaeologists have uncovered a grisly surprise. 157 skeletons in a major Viking cemetery. Buried with one of the bodies are the remains of a massive battle axe adorned with intricate silver inlay, its blade over a foot long. In its day, this would have been a valuable and lethally effective weapon. But were all of the people buried here warriors? And can they reveal why Trelleborg was built? Today, the hundreds of bone fragments discovered at Trelleborg are locked away securely underground. Here, at the University of Copenhagen. Forensic anthropologist Niels Lunerup is trying to solve the mystery of what these warriors were doing here. Having the bones really adds an extra dimension to not what we know about Trelleborg. The sheer number of bone fragments makes it difficult to work out how many individuals were buried at Trelleborg. In this box here, for instance, it's clear that we have fragments of several of the limb bones, the long bones, and of the skull. Well, we really have only the mandible, see, with a couple of teeth in. As he expects, most of the bones do appear to belong to young warriors. There's very little abrasion on the third molar, which erupts when you're 18. At Trelleborg, we find more young males than we would do in, let's say, more ordinary village cemetery. But what really shocks Nils are some of the other skeletons buried with these fighters. Surprisingly, even though we have a lot of young males, 
This is an old individual, which can be seen again from the mandible. This is probably an old female, maybe 40, 50 years of age. So why was a woman considered elderly for the time, living alongside a force of Viking soldiers? Nils believes she was part of an army of workers who supported the young warriors. Inside Trelleborg, archaeologists found parts of a loom revealing that skilled female weavers made cloth for tunics and cloaks. The people here also smelted raw materials into pure metals. Anvils found within Trelleborg reveal blacksmiths repaired weapons and forged new ones. This was a hugely sophisticated fortress, one of the most impressive in Northern Europe, built with incredible precision on an extraordinary scale. The Vikings' traditional way of life was raiding and fighting before returning home to tend to their farms. But these Vikings appeared to be a garrison stationed inside a permanent military base. Probably be compared a bit to Roman camps in England. So again, I think it reflects sort of a military encampment where uh, an army has been stationed for some time. 1,500 years ago, the Roman Empire was falling apart. Fierce tribes invaded, led by warriors like Attila the Hun. Why was Rome unable to stop them? What had happened to this superpower of the ancient world? The German city of Trier, that was once an important Roman settlement, could hold the answers. Dr. Marcus Reuter is head of Trier's team of archaeologists, scientists, and historians. He wants to find out what was making Roman life here crumble. We do not know exactly how Trier collapsed. It is a great mystery what happened to the city. There are more questions than answers. Marcus's team investigates a 10,000 square foot area north of the city, a Roman burial ground. Could it hold a clue to the fate of Trier's last Roman citizens? Hidden beneath the modern city, the dense clay soil is perfect for preserving bones. Digging down more than 10 feet below the surface reveals layer after layer of human remains. Each Roman household buried their dead in a tightly arranged plot, often alongside a selection of coins, pottery, and jewelry. The dead are crammed into a 3D jigsaw puzzle. So how many people were living in Trier when the barbarians attacked? And when did they all die? It's fantastic for me and for my colleagues to work here. Every day we find new objects, new graves and something more. Marcus joins the team on their 12th excavation north of the city wall. Each dig reveals hundreds of bodies. The colleagues find about 150 graves in this part, but it's only a small piece of a much larger cemetery with thousands of graves. The overall size of the cemetery is staggering. Marcus discovers that Trier, in its Roman heyday, was a crowded metropolis. But in the 500s, after the age of Attila, it was a shadow of its former self. In Roman times, there were about 80,000 inhabitants in Trier, but in medieval times, there were only about 5,000 inhabitants. So was a series of bloody attacks responsible for this dramatic decline? Or was something else behind the fall in the city's fortunes? Trier thrived for over 400 years, sitting near the frontier of the Roman Empire. It bordered lands occupied by fierce barbarian tribes. 
Ancient historians say that Roman Trier suffered assaults from these barbarians, time and time again. One of the most devastating attacks in this area was in 451 AD, when Attila's Huns rampaged across Europe. But is the decrease in population really related to repeated invasions by hostile tribes? To find out, Marcus needs to work out exactly when the population fell, and if it corresponds with the time of the invasion. The burial plots are incredibly dense. This makes it difficult to know which bones belong to which century. The key to dating these remains is not the bodies themselves, but all the items buried with them. The team uses the grave goods to date each burial. This helps them build up an image of how many people died in each century. It's a great problem to deal with the enormous uh, finds. We have much more excavations inside and outside the city, and uh, there are hundreds of thousands of objects, of pottery, of coins, of stones, and, and uh, much more. The dig team sends all their finds here. Trier's cavernous storage depots. Every single item, human remains or grave goods, is categorized and boxed up, ready for further analysis. All these boxes come from one excavation last year. It was a small area, but we found over 350 Roman graves. Sifting through the finds is a mammoth task. But Marcus makes an incredible discovery. Trier's population seemed to simply disappear about 100 years before Attila was even born. Most of them are dating in the first and the second century AD. Some of them are dating in the third century AD. So where are the fourth and fifth century people? We don't know. It's a great mystery. And um, we're still looking for these people. Archaeologists have now pieced together some of the biggest mysteries of the Spanish conquest of Peru, revealing how fewer than 200 conquistadors brought down an empire and made it their own. The Spanish thought that their civilization was better than that of the Incas, and so they wanted to impose it right on top of the Inca civilization. But there's one final missing piece of the puzzle. What happened to the Incas themselves? Why did they seem to disappear? Now, a sensational discovery high in the Andes could reveal the answers. In 1985, on the fringes of the Inca Empire in the Aconcagua Mountains, hikers discovered the remains of a mummified boy. They found him in a semicircular stone structure wrapped in Inca textiles and surrounded by offerings to the gods. Forensics suggest the boy was the victim of an Inca ritual sacrifice, taken up the mountain, drugged and killed with a blow to the head. The boy's body was so well preserved that over 500 years later, his DNA is still intact. The Aconcagua boy was an Inca, born near Cusco. Geneticist Antonio Salas thinks his mummified body could hold the secrets of what happened to all the Incas after the conquest. Antonio tests a DNA sample taken from the boy's corpse. We are analyzing the DNA from the mummy, and we are comparing the profile of this mummy with the profile of the populations living in South America. Antonio's team expects to find people in South America still carrying traces of the Inca's genetic profile. But he makes a shocking discovery. Almost nobody at all carries it. It's as if the Incas simply vanished. We see a continuous population growth till the arrival of Europeans. And from this point, 
there was a population decline. Antonio's investigation suggests the Spanish didn't just take over the Inca's empire, but also wiped out thousands of Inca families. Did the invaders commit genocide? The population decline of the Incas could be due to military conflicts, but also because they married with Europeans. So what you observe is that the DNA was diluted. But could something else have played an even bigger role in the decline of the Incas? When they stepped off their boats, the Spanish brought with them an invisible killer, a completely new set of diseases, including the lethal smallpox. Their immunity system were not prepared for, to fight against these germs. The arrival of the Europeans was a very tragic for Incas. For the indigenous people, disease was a time bomb. We know that uh, even today in the Amazon region, the populations uh, suffer from the impact of diseases when they enter in contact with people coming from other regions. With no natural resistance, European illnesses swept through the empire's population like wildfire, killing millions. War, intermarriage, and deadly germs destroyed the last great pre-Hispanic civilization of the Andes, the Incas. When the Spanish conquered Peru, the Inca Empire was completely dismembered. Essentially, what was going on was a massive and thorough looting operation, which was literally obliterating virtually everything they'd done. Today, the Inca's huge buildings have nearly all vanished. But visitors still marvel at the fragments that are left. <laughs> 